Alright, let's start by playing a game. Okay, so everyone raise one hand. That's right, don't be shy. Okay, good. Now, put your hand down if you never became the first ruler of an empire that would put an end to the Romans and go on to last over 600 years, span three continents, strike fear into the heart of rulers for centuries, and only fall after the end of World War I, just over a hundred years ago. Great, so now that we know who all the liars in the audience are, let's talk about Osman I, the first ruler of the Ottomans. Osman Ghazi, also known as Osman bin Ertugul bin Kunduz Alp, or Osman bin Ertugul bin Suleiman Shah, we'll get to that in just a minute, don't you worry, was the first ruler of what would come to be known as the Ottoman Empire. In fact, the name Ottoman itself is derived from Osman's name in Arabic, Uthman. While it's undoubtedly impressive to hold the claim of creating an empire that, at its peak, would span from modern-day Morocco to Iran, stretching as far as Austria for a time, Osman is as towering a historical figure as he is a mysterious one. So here's where some context needs to be given. Cause do you want to know something funny? There are no surviving records from Osman's reign. None. Zero. Nada. Zilch. Squat. I mean, normally when historians look to examine past rulers, there's at least something from the time they were around. Even if that something is highly embellished and basically a myth. No such dice with Osman though. The reason for this is likely one, the Turks of Osman's clan were still fairly nomadic and had just recently settled down, decreasing the likelihood of writing things down. Two, for most of Osman's life, he was relatively small on the radar of people who would write down accounts of him, i.e. Europe or the Islamic Caliphates, or three, a mix of one and two. Most of the accounts we do have about Osman himself come from later Ottoman records over 100 years after he died. And those records had a pretty clear purpose of puffing up the founder of their empire. It's because of that little tidbit that, according to one source, historians find it very challenging to differentiate between fact and myth in the many stories surrounding Osman. And, according to another, Osman may be the most important historical figure we know almost nothing about. Both statements are fairly accurate. For example, his name! See, I told you we'd get back to that. Some scholars have suggested that Osman went by the Turkish form of his name, Ataman, based on some Greek accounts from the time, whereas other Arabic sources say he went by Othman, the Arabized form of his name. Ibn Battuta, a crazy historical figure who deserves a full-blown video of his own one day, while he was traveling through the realm of Osman's successor Orhan, referred to the prior ruler as Osmankuk, or Little Osman. So we have a more Arabized version of his name, but that suffix, Kuk, is Turkish! What does it all mean? While I and many other people who actually deserve to be called historians believe that Osman may have started with his Turkish name and later in his life changed it to the more prestigious Arabized one, again, because of the very little records we have of him, there's no way to be 100% sure. For the sake of this video, I'll continue to refer to him as Osman, which is what most in the West know him as and is itself an Arabized version of his Turkish name. So with that little tangent out of the way, we do know some things about Osman, and even more about the events he played a role in throughout his life. It's just important to know that any stories I go on to say about him specifically are probably made up by Ottoman writers centuries after his death. Or at the very least, we don't have a way of truly cooperating them. So with all that being said, sit back, relax, get whatever food or beverage will make this more interesting for you, because this is what we do know. Tradition says that the Turks that would later become the Ottomans originally called Central Asia their home. This group was one of many that fled from their homelands westward to escape the Mongol wave that was sweeping the continent in the early 13th century. After this migration, the Turkish group settled in Anatolia, in a part of the territory of the Seljuk Rum Sultanate. For the next few decades, the Turks settled in pretty well within Rum. At this time, the Seljuks would constantly be fending off raids from the Persian Khwarezmians, the Mongol Ilkhanate, and even the Byzantine Empire, which was just starting to pick up the shambles of its poor, poor territory after a thorough Fourth Crusade ding. It's said that during these raids, the Turks really proved their worth to Rome, with their efficiency and bravery to fill the first lines in battle proving to be a major factor in multiple Seljuk victories. Seeing a vital ally in the Turks, the Rum Sultan appointed the Emir of the Turkish clan, Ertegrul, to a high-ranking military position within the Sultanate, as well as granting him a swath of territory in the fertile lands of what is today Ankara, just for good measure. 
Ethereal had ambitions beyond this, and he would spend the next half century conquering and consolidating towns and castles into his territory, or Beylik. Most of the time, Ethereal attracted Byzantine possessions, with historians generally agreeing he did this to avoid picking fights with his stronger Turkic neighbors. Ethereal's most important conquest was probably the city of Sogut, which was right on the border with the Byzantine frontier, and which he would later make his Beylik's capital. Ethereal lived to a ripe old age of 90 years old, and with his death led the way for his son to succeed him, Osman. What little we know about Osman, we know even less about his childhood. Historians tend to put his birth at around 1254 or 55 in Sogut, but again, nothing is certain. However, we can assume that he was raised learning the most important things that royals did at the time. Wrestling, archery, swordship, those fun things. It's also reasonable to assume that the education in Islamic ways and teachings played a central role in his development, and this would become a key motivator in the decisions he would make later in life. Osman ascended to leadership in 1281 with the death of Ertugul, but his ascension may have been just a little bit south of a peaceful transition of power. According to some sources, Ertugul's brother and Osman's uncle, Dandar Bey, tried to rise up in revolt against Osman or take his brother's position of power. The reasons he had for this are a little shaky, with the best records we have citing his concern that Osman's ambition as ruler had him concerned that they would lead to the destruction of the clan. However, all of this amounted to nothing, and Dandar Bey was captured and executed by Osman himself. Oh well. There's a story from the beginning of Osman's reign that, true or not, I think it's important and worth telling because at the very least it depicts what the Ottoman Turks thought of Osman. So, at the beginning of his reign, Osman was staying at the house of an important religious leader. At this house, Osman had a dream, and, well, I'll just let the sources take care of this one. He saw that a moon arose from the holy man's breast, and came to sink in his own breast. A tree then sprouted from his navel, and its shade encompassed the world. Beneath this shade there were mountains, and streams flowed forth from the foot of each mountain. Some people drank from these running waters, others watered gardens, while yet others caused fountains to flow. When Osman awoke from this dream, he told the holy man, and in response essentially said, Wow, really? And it rose up from within you? The whole world, you say? You know what? That's a pretty good bet. Here, take my daughter to marry. You're going to do great things. Son. Whether the story is true or not, it serves as important context for how the Ottomans felt about Osman, and largely their empire and with the context we know, it would prove eerily prophetic. So, a tree that would cover the whole world has to start as a little sapling sometime, and by golly, that's what Osman set out to do. The position of the Ottoman Beylik was pretty much the best spot to be located to expand. It was far enough into Anatolia to avoid the wrath of the Mongols, and it was positioned right next to Byzantine territory. The Byzantines, on top of being in a weakened state due to near constant wars in Europe, were also Christian, and this gave Osman the goal of not only conquest against them, but holy war, to add territory to an Islamic caliphate. Osman began his conquest securing multiple Byzantine castles, and eventually establishing territory up to the city of Bursa, which would be an important staging ground for future expeditions against the Byzantines, and which his son, Orhan, would make the Ottoman capital during his reign. Osman had desires to stretch his territory northward along the Anatolian coast and west to the Sea of Marmara, but his territorial expansion received a boost in the southern direction with the collapse of Rum. So this whole time, Osman was still subservient to Rum. Remember, his father had assisted the Seljuk Rum, which is how he got his territory in the first place. Since then, the Ottoman overlord was the Sultan of Rum, and the Sultan's overlord was in turn the Mongol Ilkhanate which had subjected them with the earlier Mongol conquests of the Middle East and Anatolia. This power dynamic would change around the turn of the century, however. Historical sources differ on the specifics of how Rum collapsed. Some say the Sultan was summoned by the Ilkhanate and executed when he arrived. Some others say that the Ilkhanate and other Turkic hordes just straight up raided the Sultan and killed the Sultan that way. Regardless, we can tell that with external instability combined with the increasingly independent nature of the subservient Beyliks, Rum collapsed around 1300. With this collapse, Osman was now officially an independent ruler, as well as dozens of other Beyliks left in the wake of Rum, but unlike those losers, Osman was far enough away so as not to incur the wrath of the Mongols, 
With the territory of the Byzantines, Osman felt confident enough to do what his father never did. He conquered south, against his neighboring Turks. There's a reason we know about this guy who ruled over a small section of Anatolia 700 years ago, and sure enough, Osman was successful in these campaigns as well, and his territory reached its peak. Shortly after this, in 1324, the legends say Osman shook off his mortal coil, leaving the small patch of land subservient to a sultan that he'd inherited a sizable independent territory that concerned both the Byzantines and people of Anatolia for his son to succeed him. So why do we talk about Osman? I mean, that's a reasonable question you might be having, considering if you just look at his life on face value, he's a guy who ruled over a small piece of land, who became a guy who ruled over a slightly less small piece of land. Like, I mean, we're talking about Rhode Island here, tops. But I would argue that Osman is so much more than the governor of Rhode Island. While he never adopted the title of Sultan himself, going by either Emir or Bey, Osman was the first in a line of descendants that would include 35 Ottoman Sultans. The Ottoman Empire that was created from the state Osman founded would become one of the strongest states in the world. It was Osman's descendant, Mehmed II, that would break the walls of Constantinople in 1453 and conquer the Roman Empire once and for all. The ramifications of Osman's reign are genuinely really hard to put into words all at once. With the fall of Constantinople, Europe started to look west instead of east, and that's how the Americas became a permanent part of our global history. In this way, the Ottoman Empire really did become a tree to cover the world, and none of it, none of it, would have been possible without Osman. Thank you so much for watching. Um, here are my sources about this video if you want to read more for yourself. I highly encourage it. It was a very interesting topic. Um, but unfortunately, I have to go here soon because I'm running up on the 12 minute mark. So thank you so much for watching and bye!